with the Twin Peaks podcast and occasionally other podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skaggs, back in Ghostwood Forest, still hiding out from 2020 because Shakes Fist 2020. And, uh, but thankfully I'm here with my wonderful co-host, fellow X-File and um, avid DVD collector, Zan Sprouse. How you doing, Zan? I'm doing good. I'm just sort of an avid, don't want to buy the same thing twice collector. <laughs> I only do that for very special things, yes. and I think at this point that list has now been whittled down to Elvis Costello re-releases and Star Wars re-releases. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to tell you how many times I've bought Elvis Costello's first record, because it's a lot. Well, that's probably as many as I've bought Star Wars, so... That's even more. <laughs> yeah. Or, or you know, Twin Peaks, including all the, yeah. you know, the VHS and DVD and the... Blu-rays and I will say I never did buy the VHS of Twin Peaks because well, I, only I got, just take I only had the pilot and um and Fire Walk with me on on VHS. Yeah, I only ever had episodes taped off of television. Okay. Cuz I taped them off of Bravo when they reran on Bravo in 95. So I had those forever. And because, then because once, you had those great log lady intros, I had the great log lady intros, yeah. And then when they, so yeah, I bought that first DVD, and I think it was wasn't it one? Were there two seasons on? Didn't they do two box sets of both? Or was it? I forget how the, it what, the way they did it was. The pilot was um, it wasn't an, uh, an official release. It was a okay. you know it was a bootleg, and yeah. then and then. They released season one on uh, as a DVD set, season two as a DVD set. Uh huh. That's the right. That's right. But the season one DVD set did not have the pilot, so you that's had right. To, that was that's why you had to get one, the right? that's why you had to get the bootleg DVD. You had to get the bootleg. But then the gold box came out. Then the gold box came out. And everybody was happy because the pilot, the pilot was on there. The pilot was with seasons one and two, and right. lots of great special features. The Saturday Night Live. Yeah. So that's why we still have the gold box. Exactly. Even though we bought the Blu-ray of the complete mystery, and then we bought the the box set of Z to A, and then we bought the big box set. Oh, don't forget, don't forget the uh, the limited event series Blu-rays. Yeah. So yeah. When when exactly. season three came out, so yeah. Yeah, season three we got the limited event, and then we have the big box set of everything because we needed a resin standy apparently. <laughs> and well, that was I, worth $170 to us apparently. You had to get those two bonus discs that were never we had to released. Get the bonus discs and the resin thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I I think I'm going to have to be done with Twin Peaks unless there's another season. I'm talking to you, David Lynch. Unless they release it all in 4K ultra high def. And I'm talking to you, Mark Frost. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's the so. Thing. So, if you want to finance this, yeah, yeah, just let us know. I mean, that's why I kind of wondered why we got the Z to A set. I thought that that release was to help finance a possible Twin Peaks season four. I that's part of why I happily purchased it. Yeah, you know, and I did buy the soundtrack. Take a my couple money. of times. Yeah, shut up and take my money. I bought the soundtrack a couple of times. You know, I had my cassette of Firewalk with me that I got signed. So now I have the CD of that. And then I had the the vinyl releases of that. So yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. Elvis Costello Records, Twin Peaks, whatever, and Star Wars, whatever. I will buy those multiple times for no apparent reason. Okay. But yeah, other upgrades like the X-Files. Yes. It's going to take an incredibly crazy guy behind 
guy in an alley selling burned merchandise from when a toy store exploded. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Brad Dorif, by the way, that is, I just described the opening of uh, Child's Play, which is how uh, Catherine Hicks gets gets her Chucky doll. Is there's a there's a homeless guy selling uh, burned merchandise from when the toy store exploded when from from when Brad Dorif was trying to get away from the cops. It's just a little extra crispy. No big deal. Yeah, just it's just if it's just a little bit singed on the edges, but it's ten bucks. Maybe I'll do that. But, but it's yeah. but it's still smoldering. No, <laughs> I can put it out, and then I'll have eight more inches on my shelf for other things that I can buy. So, and it yeah. has that lovely charcoal smell. And then, yeah, it has a nice, you know, that, that, woodsy. That, that melted plastic smell. Yeah, it's nice and woodsy. It feels very rustic. Yeah. So. All right. So we, so unless you think that because, well, hey, we're a Twin Peaks podcast. We were not going to talk Twin Peaks. We just got some Twin Peaks discussion in there before, as Zen was so kind enough to help segue to. Mm-hmm. Because today we're talking The X-Files once again. Uh, for episode 82, we're talking Beyond the Sea. Beyond the Sea, yes. Because this, because we are Ghostwood, the tangentially Twin Peaks podcast. Yes. Because. The occasionally Twin Peaks podcast. The tangentially Twin Peaks podcast, because as we were just discussing, there's not enough Twin Peaks. So. Yes. You have to start in the middle and then spiral outward with everything, you know, six degrees, 12 degrees, 18 degrees of, of Twin Peaks. And that's what we're doing here. Exactly. Because unless unless David Lynch wants to give us another season. Yeah. You know, we we kind of have to expand the orbit of Twin Peaks a little mm-hmm. bit. The yeah. the Venn diagram of Twin Peaks, essentially. Yep. And so – and the X-Files had quite a few episodes of Twin Peaks people in them and, in general, David Lynch people in them. Exactly. And this episode has two of those. That's right. The late, great Don S. Davis, Major Garland Briggs. Rest in peace, Major Briggs. Rest in peace, Major Briggs. And pouring out one for my homie. Yes. And the still very much alive and from the great Midwestern part of the United States, Brad Dorf, Mr. Piter DeVries. Yes. And I cannot think of his name from Blue Velvet. What's his name in Blue Velvet? I... His, his name's Raymond, but I'm going to run that down if you're interested. I'm going to yeah, run, run, all that cast, run all that casting information down. So. Yeah, run, run it down. All right. Yeah. So, But first, I do want to mention that, okay, so Beyond the Sea – Came out back on January seventh, nineteen ninety four. I was a senior in high school. Yeah, I was. I was a couple years out of college. No, I was. No, I take that back. I was. This was five years out of college for me, almost. Really? So, yeah. Got kind of graduated. No, was, no, I take that back. I graduated in ninety one. So I was thinking about three years I, out of college. I was thinking five years because I. I Ended at Kent State, and then we moved down to Florida in '89. Okay. So that's why th- that's why I'm thinking of that. So yeah, so three years out of college for me on this one. Yeah, I was gonna say you're only seven years older than me, uh-huh. Charles. Yeah, I know, I know. But obviously, the senility is creeping in on me. There's that. There's a <laughs> yeah. Uh, written by Glenn Morgan and James Wong, executive Heck producers. Yes. So one of you know the great writing teams of the X Files. Directed by the great David Nutter. Oh, yes. Who's directed many an X-Files episode, but also some really big episodes of Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. the X-Files spinoff Millennium, which I was a which fan of back fabulous. in a very creepy, cool show. Yeah. Um, but he also directed the pilots for Smallville, Arrow, and The Flash, the 2014 wow. version. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. Did a really Not the John job. Wesley ship flash? <laughs> not the John Wesley ship flash. No. Not from 1990. Yeah. So. Nope. Mm-hmm. But yeah, did a great job on all of those. John Wesley ship from the Never Ending Story Part 2. <laughs> yes. I'm a big John Wesley ship fan. He's cool. He's great. He's, he's, a... he's, he's great. I love, I love it when he pops up. Yeah. So... But here's the thing, Charles. Do you want to know how little I know about Stargate? How little do you know about Stargate? Probably as little as I know about Stargate because I never watched it. I literally had no idea that Don Davis was on Stargate. Well, see, I knew that. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, because I would see him in promos and stuff, and I'm like, oh, hey, Major Briggs is on Stargate. Cool. Yeah. But it, but it wasn't enough to get me to watch Stargate. I didn't even get that far, because I would have been like, oh, hey, Major Briggs, maybe I should watch Stargate. And I might have watched one episode and been like, ah, no, I, I just I just can't. I've got a friend, my friend Kim, 
Yeah. Loves the James Spader. She loves the James Spader. Right. And he was, so he was in that movie. Yeah, the movie. He was in the movie. movie. And I'm like, I saw this movie and I just did not. And then the series came out and I'm like, I got nothing against MacGyver, but there is not a lot driving me to this. So I was not a Stargate fan. So I was so little of a Stargate fan. I had no idea that Don Davis was in it. Yeah. Post, post MacGyver, Richard Dean Anderson led that show. Yep. SG, yep. SG1. So speaking of Don Davis, who, of course, in this episode plays Captain, Navy Captain William Scully. Navy Captain William Scully. Who yes. I still argue is the same character, Major Briggs. Only, you know, living it, living a double life with a brand new exactly. family and kids and whatnot. Yeah, he has all of those times where Major Briggs goes missing. He's just in Washington, D.C. with his other family. He's got four other kids and a different wife because he's a very, very similar character. Very straight-laced, very – and he's even, you know, on the metaphysical plane where he comes back as a ghost to see Scully an hour after he dies. And we are definitely going to talk about that. That's for sure. And so, yeah. So, yeah, he's – I think it's a very similar similar character. It was interesting because – And I argue that um, he killed himself off in this episode – so that he could spend his time full time with Betty Briggs back in Twin Peaks. Right. Right. Exactly. That's what that was. That's what that was for. Well, actually, no. Wouldn't he have didn't he pass? Wouldn't he have passed away around the same time? No, because remember, um, he oh, he was. Around. I thought Major. I thought Major Briggs died in like 95. I'm not sure when Major Briggs died on Twin Peaks. I'll have to. We'll have to read that book. We need. We need, he, we need. We need to research that. He had been dead for like for like twenty years when the return came out. Okay, break out the yarn and the murder board, and let's connect all this. Murder board. Murder, murder board. board. So um, you love it when I say that. I love murder board, but the uh, yeah. So I think he, I think he died right around. I think they died right around the same time. So that's a damn good. There's question. some sort of weird. There, the Navy has a Project Blue Book. Yeah, that we just don't know about. Right, that's we, the thing. We know Air Force had, uh, you know, the the Project Blue Book. So right, the Navy has one too. They have to have one too. The Navy and version. see, and you know, yeah, he's he's got you know, he's all. I mean, there's probably some, like, uh, what what was he in Stargate? Was he in the Army? Is he you know is he protecting us from weird things on land, on sea, and in the air? I mean, is <laughs> is Don Davis just protecting us from every possible line of defense here? Yeah, Don Davis. This um, is like Crisis on Infinite um, Major Breaks. Oh, my God. That needs to happen. Um, all, all these different incarnations of Major Breaks. Yeah, exactly. Well, Don Davis, uh, I thought this was I thought this was pretty hilarious, was um, – Don Davis is actually Dr. Don Davis. Okay. He has a PhD in theater. Okay. Interesting. And he was teaching theater in British Columbia for at the University of British Columbia for a while. I think that's where he got his master's. Right. Or that's where he got his PhD. I forget which one. But he said he tried to go on auditions, but he couldn't do the Canadian accent, so he wasn't getting parts, which is why he came to Seattle, which is how he got the Twin Peaks gig. Interesting. I didn't know that. Because he got an agent in Seattle because of the British Columbia. He couldn't do the accent right. <laughs> well, one of the one of the things I learned while I was you know doing some research was that he apparently was the stunt double for the guy who played Pete, Dana Elkar, on MacGyver. What kind of Richard Dean Anderson wormhole are we going to go down in this? I know, right? In this Don Davis research. So apparently we need to cover MacGyver. 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 Okay. For the record, Charles started that, okay? Yes. Charles started it. That was not me. <laughs> for the record. Um, but it's so much fun to say when you do the sense of thing. McGyver. Aunt Selma has one hour to live. <laughs> yeah, so I'm responsible for that Simpsons reference. Yeah, you. Yeah, you did. I will that. take. Right, I will take. The you blade, started yeah. that. Yes. So, so, um, so, so uh, Don Davis also he returns as William Scully for one episode, one breath later on. Yeah, yeah, he comes back, and then of course he plays on. We talked about Stargate SG One, and he was also in the uh, the t 2003 version of the Twilight Zone. He was, but I have not seen all of those. I am actually very behind on that Forest Whitaker Twilight Zone. Interesting. So. All right. And we talked about that he was in Luke Who's Talking last time with um, William B. Davis. Him and William B. Davis are both doctors in Look Who's Talking. Yep. And he was also in A League of Their Own. The movie. Yes, he is the, he is the, um, 
he's the coach of the Racine Bells in okay. the League of Their Own. Okay. It's Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is the coach of the Rockford Peaches. Okay, so they were the rivals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the where the the Lori Petty character gets traded to the Racine Racine Bells. Okay, so yeah. all right. It's uh, I've never seen that movie, so there's there's a very sweet scene where everyone is looking at all they they have tryouts all day, mm-hmm. and at the end of the day they have I don't remember how many teams, and then they have a little little list up on a board just like everybody the roster yeah. Yeah, the roster the player roster. So they go up and everybody finds out what team they're on and they go sit with their team. And Don Davis is saying, all right, well, welcome to the first All-American Girls Baseball League. And there's this woman who's still looking at the board, looking, looking for her name. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, honey, are you on the cut list? And she like doesn't know what to say. And he's like, listen, I'm sorry, you're cut, but you're going to have to leave the field. And so one of the, one of the Rockford Peaches runs up to her and says, Hi, can you read, honey? She says, no. So she's like, okay, what's your name? And so they go through all the lists. They go through all the names. And she's like, Shirley Baker, there's your name. There you are. You're with us. And Don Davis is just, he just gives her a really nice smile and says, go join your team. Like, he doesn't give her a hard time. He's just real sweet about it. It's a very, it's it's the best. It's my favorite scene. So he's a good guy. Yeah, he's a really good guy. Yeah. He's, yeah, it's my favorite scene in that movie because it's just so cute. All right. That's cool. And, you know, Don Davis. So Enough said there, right? It's a win-win right there. Well, speaking of other win-wins, Brad Dorif, we've already talked about a little bit. As... Brad Dorif from Huntington, West Virginia, which is just spitting distance from Chesapeake, Ohio, which is right on the Ohio-West Virginia border. Salute. Salute. Hometown of my friend Shelly Hessen. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, he plays, of course, Luther Lee Boggs in the story. Yep. And Zan already mentioned that he was Peter DeVries in the 1984 Dune, directed by David Lynch. Yep. Which we still have to talk about here on Ghostwood one of these days. We haven't done that. We have not done Dune yet. Oh my gosh! Well, maybe we'll do that as a little, you know, amuse bouche when Denis Villeneuve shows up finally. Yeah, whenever that whenever that arrives, whatever millennium we finally get to see that movie. Which damn it it needs to be now. I need that in my life. Pretty much. I think all of us need that movie now. Seriously. We're supposed to at least get a trailer for that soon. <sighs> they keep saying that. It says it's coming up like around uh second week in September, I think. Oh god. I'm like we can get a Batman trailer, but we can't get a Dune trailer. Well, you know, to be fair, DC did have their own fandom online event for that. They had their own event. I understand that. But, I mean, Den- 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 Which actually went, know, went over pretty well, I thought. But I just, you know, you know, at least we're going to be get August 28th, at least we get Bill and Ted Save the World. Right. You mean Face the Music. Face the Music, yes. Bill and Ted Face the Music, yes. I don't know why I keep saying the wrong thing. That's all right. Yeah, because, because I they have probably COVID brain. Save the world in that. Yeah, because you... I have COVID brain and I don't know anything right now. <laughs> Exactly. So, so, yeah. the, so needless to say, the digressions are going to be fast and furious this week. They're going to be fast and furious because I have COVID brain, just like the rest of us. And we all know that the COVID brain is ridiculous. Even Holly, who kindly wrote to me last time and reminded me that it's Nicholas Lee, not Nicholas Ray. Yeah. She's like, hey, uh, by the way, I'm like, damn it. Yeah. That's right. Oh. But Holly is very sweet about it when she does it. And Holly understands my COVID brain. Yeah. So I really appreciate yeah, we it. All, we all appreciate I that. I have the COVID brain. Who, by the way, was in uh, the episode right after this, Gender Bender. And I was watching that going like, oh, my God, is that Crycheck before he was Crycheck? It's pre-Crycheck. It's pre-Crycheck. And he's still a horrible douchebag in that episode. Yep. That's probably what got him the role, I'm guessing. But they're like, wow, you were an amazing douchebag. Yeah. Can you come back for, like, you know, 18 episodes and do this other guy? That'd be great. So uh, back to Brad Dorff. He was also, of course, Raymond in Blue Velvet. Yes, he was. One of uh, another David. One of Frank's role. cronies. One of Frank's cronies. Yep. Uh, Grime a worm tongue, of course, in Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yep. So hanging out with Saruman, Saruman all day. And, and like I said, the voice of Chucky in Child's Play. Exactly. Chucky in the Child's Play movies. Also, Doc Cochran on Deadwood, which is a show I'm a big fan of. That was on HBO. Great, yep. uh, great Western series. He was also on episodes of Star Trek Voyager, Moonlighting, and Babylon 5. And he's in 
uh, um, he's in just about everything, really. Yeah, he's in Alien Resurrection, and I'm the only person in the world that likes that movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I've seen the movie. I just uh, yeah. don't have as great me memories about that movie. I like Alien. I like Janae and Caro. I don't have a problem with anything in that movie. Okay, got it. <laughs> it's a stupid plot, but I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, it does have Ron Perlman in it. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. So right there, points for Hellboy. Yeah, uh, and Brad Dorif. And Brad Dorif, of course. We also get the first appearance, very first appearance of Sheila Larkin as Margaret Scully, Scully's mom, and she has yes, been in right. she's Scully's been in episodes mom. of Doogie Howser, MD, which I thought was kind of funny. Okay, The Incredible Hulk and Starsky like, Hutch. Like yeah, exactly, Bill Bixby. Dun, 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 no, yep. Dun, 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 dun. Na, 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 na. Oh, Charles, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Don't, yeah, don't, don't make me angry. <laughs> the creature is filled with rage. The creature, and he must let the world think that he's dead. <laughs> so, dun, 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 dun. All right, so now we've done the credits for uh, The Incredible Hulk. We're good, we're good here. Now I want you to watch the 70s Incredible Hulk, but anyway. Is it still on on Saturday nights on uh, MeTV? I don't know. I don't think so. I never see it. All right. And we also had um, Lawrence King is, plays Lucas Henry in this episode. Yes. So, yes. But he doesn't have much of a resume, so I didn't bother writing that down. He doesn't have much of a presence in this episode either, so it's okay. No. Yeah, that's all right. Trivia. thought I'd mention some trivia points in this one before we get into our big discussion. So uh, obviously this one's – Essentially, the first episode that kind of shows Mulder and Scully swapping roles. Yes. At, you know, from the believe, you know, with Mulder being the believer and, the, and Scully being the skeptic. So you've you've got the reverse here. And it also in introduced the theme of father figures, which pretty much permeates this entire series. Right. Because they both they both have tumultuous relationships with their fathers, both Mulder and Scully. And also does, uh, you know, Spender, because his father is the cigarette smoking man. And we and we still haven't seen, we, we haven't seen uh, Skinner isn't really. No, not yet. Not until season two, I don't think. Or like the end of season, season one, maybe. Yeah, he, yeah, he shows up. I think he shows up after the host in season two, if I'm not mistaken. He's definitely, he's definitely in the host. Yeah. Um, he's who sends Mulder okay. on the host. Okay, so um, season two, probably. So I think it's – yeah, I think it's after – you know, spoiler alert, everybody. It's after Deep Throat gets killed and then Skinner comes in. What? No, I'm just kidding. What? Deep Throat gets killed? How could you tell me this? It's been a – that's a 26-year secret I've been keeping. No. Yeah. So um, I think that's when he – but but Skinner sort of becomes the father figure for both of them. Skinner. Skinner. Oh, wait. There's another Simpsons reference. Uh, that's my fault. That's – I'm telling you. there. That's two. You're just setting me up. I'll keep. I'll. I'll. I'll ride with you on these. But I'm just. I'm trying to be good, and you're just setting me up. That's all right. I'll get around. I'll get around to Batman 1989 eventually. Excellent. I can't wait. <laughs> so, um, well, as I was saying, Scully, she has dinner with her parents. Her father gives her a hard time about still having the Christmas tree up because apparently they always had to take it down immediately the day after Christmas. So, in a little minor act of rebellion, she leaves the Christmas tree up. But we don't have a lot more story about Scully's family yet. She has the uh, she has the sister who kind of left for a while, and then the brother nobody talks to. So there's a lot going on in this family that we don't know yet. This is yeah. just our first taste of Scully's family. This is, this is just the introduction. Yeah, yeah. Flaky Melissa doesn't come along until later. Right. Flaky Melissa doesn't come along, and then um, I think it's Bill, the one that nobody that barely anyone talks to. I think you're right. I think you're yeah. right. But Scully has these little moments of rebellion for her father. You know, she grew up in this military family. We find out later in the series that they did live on base housing a lot of the time. So I think her family was very much like the Briggs family. You know, her father probably came home and you know, everyone was their full name. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you know, he said, you know, Robert, your mother and I are here for you. You know, all that kind of stuff that he's, he, you know, he's so wooden, but he's trying to be compassionate. He, he's making the effort, but because it's just his, just of who he is. 
Right. He can't right. be he can't be personable. Right. He's not that he's not that personable. So yeah. he um so she has the little you know, she has small rebellion of leaving the Christmas tree up past the day before Christmas yep. or the day after Christmas to stealing her mother's cigarettes to then big ones like becoming an FBI agent rather than being a medical doctor. And he was apparently not very happy that she did that. He was not particularly happy that she did that, which is interesting to me because... And I'd like to learn more about that. I would like to learn more about that, too, because Captain Scully is essentially part of a similar part of the government. The the sort of... It's not necessarily law enforcement, but it's another entity of the government that is that is regimented, that is ranked, <laughs> that yeah. um, upholds the the rules. I mean, he, it's, so I'm I'm just I'm wondering what it was about the FBI that he didn't like about the FBI that he didn't like. Yeah, or if it was just why did I pay for medical school for you to not be a doctor? I don't know if it was right. that practical or what. The but deal she was. does be, but she does become a doctor though, just not a, a you know a practice practicing doctor. Right, she's not a practicing medical doctor. She is able to do autopsies and yes. she can She's a medical examiner. Right, she's the Quincy of this game. And yes. but she doesn't have a practice. She's not working in a hospital. She's not you know opening you know she's not doing She does, she's she's not operating her own business. Well, she's not she's not every her everyday life is not her medical doctor speciality. Shall we say, yeah. you know, she'll she'll sometimes do autopsy, she'll do medical examination, but even then, there are some t- there are some cases that they do where there's nothing for her to do in that situation. So I think that I don't like I said I don't know is he just wondering why did we send you to medical school for you to not be a practicing doctor, or if there's something about the FBI he doesn't like. Like would he have been okay if she had? Followed him in the Navy? Been a, or, or been a Quincy. Like if she had been a medical examiner for the county of Los Angeles. That's a good question. You know, is it is it the FBI specifically? I don't know. It's very interesting. And we never find out if memory serves. Not to my knowledge. So if anybody else out there knows, uh, maybe it was in an X-Files novel or something that they filled in. Oh, and there's so many of those. Yes, there are. That I just yes, did not are. read. Um, some other trivia I thought was interesting was that this episode was written in response to criticisms about Scully's rather, shall we say, limited characterization up until this point. Well, it was still the 90s, and it was right. the infancy of people being able to write female characters. Yes. So um, I think I, I think it was interesting that there was a little bit more to Scully, and it was the relationship with her father rather than the relationship with her mother. Because a lot of times when you have those personal stories, it's, you know, if it's about women, it's about how they relate to their mothers. And if it's about men, it's how they relate to their fathers. So I liked that it was a little more, a little less cliched that it was how yes. she related to her father as opposed to her mother. Um, but that's, yeah, that's the thing. It, it, Scully is sort of, Scully's the straight man in the X-Files. I mean, she's the she is the one that's brought in to... Rain Mulder in. Rain Mulder yeah. in and bring him down off of his cloud and find the Occam's razor explanation for everything that they're investigating. So to have her in this role of something else going on in her life, something personal about her, something vulnerable about, vulnerable, vulnerable about her, and something that makes her want to believe so badly. And even she says with Mulder, she's like, Hi, why aren't you just happy that I'm believing this? Finally. Like... <laughs> You know why are and he talks about how he he wants her to believe, but um, only when there's something to actually believe. Right, not like this, not like this at all. And because he because he he's completely skeptical, distrusting. He's very skeptical and distrusting of Luther Lee Boggs. Of Luther yeah. Lee Boggs, and he gives you a lot of reasons why you should be skeptical of him. But then, as you keep watching, you wonder he has something because, as she said. If he knew I was your partner, he could have found out some things about me. But how would he have known that Beyond the Sea was played at my parents' wedding? 
Right. Those little things. So there's little. It's a, it's a pretty damn good coincidence. That... How would he know that her, that that her father called her Starbuck? Yeah. Which I always wonder what that is. Did they watch Battlestar Galactica when she was a kid? <laughs> no, I know it would be it would be cool if that was the case. I would love I would love that. <laughs> but 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 really, Ahab and Starbuck that actually comes from Herman Melville's um, novel Moby Dick, which we know she adores because of yes. Queequeg, her dog. Exactly. Yeah. Who sadly meets his end. Poor Queequeg. Oh, poor Queequeg. He's had a rough life. He had to live with Peter, Peter Boyle, and then he yes, to... <laughs> right, right. <laughs> he has to eat yeah. Peter Boyle's face off, and then he has to. <laughs> poor little Queequeg has to. Has yeah. To... But yeah, it's just I, I would, I just, I'm always like, yeah, I know this is a Moby Dick thing, but I think that would have been so cute if they could have watched. That would that, that would have been kind of like I think. Yeah, well, nowadays, if you if you you know redid the X Files, God forbid, but but if you did it, um, you could say that she was a fan of the the two thousand three Battlestar Galactica. You could say that, but I like the Moby Dick connection a little bit better because she has that they've run through that so much throughout the entire series. Yeah, so it has it has residence. Mm-hmm, yeah. It does. Uh, so apparently, L- executives at Fox vetoed the idea of this episode. Two times before Chris Carter, the you know creator of the X Files showrunner, said, "Nope, told the network we're doing this." So yeah, well. I thought that was kind of interesting. It's good to see Carter standing up for it for this because this is obviously a game changer in terms of Scully. It is, yes, and really kind of set her established the you know that writers could do more with the character. I think, and 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 why Dana Scully became one of the very first strong women on television very true one of the first one of the first icons in that regard right you know she was very like i said yes in the pilot she's in her underwear but she has a reason you know right. we can we can we can rationalize that a little bit more she was trying to show Mulder the bumps at least they at least they went that yes it was kind of gratuitous but they justified it. Right. And in in this episode, too, we still have, throughout the series, we still have a larger ratio of Scully needing to be rescued by Mulder than Mulder needing to be rescued by Scully. Right. But in this episode, we have Scully rescuing Mulder and taking care of Mulder after after he's out of commission, he gets shot. He gets shot, and he's taken off the board halfway through this episode. And I will say that I think she gets some points for when you know when he gets quote unquote abducted at the end of yeah at the end of what series two or three I forget which one. Um, she does a lot to get him back. So yes, she does. You know, there's <laughs> they, yes, they, she does. You know, even if he, you know, I think that one time is worth like five times for her, but still, well, you know. He does. He does pay her back in the first X Files movie. Yeah, because remember she gets taken. Yep, and she gets taken aboard that you know that alien spacecraft buried in Antarctica. Uh huh. You know, so so he goes all the way down to Antarctica to right. to rescue her. So they're going to pretty much go to the ends of the earth for each other. As exactly. Partners. Exactly. Yeah. So, so and I don't think they're keeping score, but um, we are. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> we are. Okay, so so what's the tally then? I have no right. idea. I I was keeping score twenty years ago, but the when did the X Files go off the air? Two thousand three. Let's see, nine seasons. Two thousand three or four Pro- or something like that. Prob- probably probably two thousand two. Yeah, I forget exactly. And then you know we had the we had the I Want to Believe movie. It fight the future. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you know, Fight the Future was between seasons five and six. Right. Oh, yeah. And I so. want to believe it was after everything. And then we had – Yeah. Then we had the Lone Gunman series, which was so fun. And that yeah, I don't own. Yeah, it was own, shortly, shortly. That I don't yeah. own on DVD, and I really need to because it's so good. Um, it was good. And then Millennium was where we went right. after X-Files. It, you know, it's not X-Files. It's tangentially X-Files related, but um, – pretty, pretty much. Yeah, it's been a long time. That's all I'm saying. It's been like almost 20 years. I don't remember the tally. Then we waited for uh, seasons 10 and 11, finally. Yes, which uh, were pretty... 2016, 2016 we talked about. Yeah, yeah, yeah which was... So it was, was, was a good wait. They got kind of sexy, I have to say. <laughs> Putting on a little uh, mileage, but it looks good on as they, right. as As Mulder says, put a dimmer on that afterglow, Scully. My goodness. Nice. Mulder and Scully get, a, get it on, for those of you who haven't watched it yet. Now you have to watch it. 
Yeah, exactly. Spoilers for everybody. Because who, not only is it just Fox, now checking out the X Files for the first time, it's Fox in the uh, in like 2016, so it gets pretty sexy. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Morgan and uh, James Wong vet or excuse me fought hard to get Brad Dorif to play the role of Luther Lee Boggs. And against, thank God they against did. the concern against the concerns of the cost of hiring him. Yeah, exactly, because he was perfect for this episode. How much can Brad Dorif possibly cost? I don't know, but Chris Carter had to call the president of 20th Century Fox, Peter Roth, wow. during a Thanksgiving dinner to convince him to let them cast Dorif. See, that's, you know, Brad Dorif is a good guy. He is no prima donna. There is no way he cost that much money that he caused that much problem. I mean, come on. I don't know. Well, apparently he was asked to appear in the episode with only four days to prepare. So mm-hmm. he originally refused that part until the producers gave him another week to get ready. See, that's how good Brad Dorif is, you guys. Yeah, you're not going to do him on short notice. No, he is just that good. Even if he only has like 2 weeks, he's going to be this he's going to be this good. Yeah, and apparently while getting into character between takes, he did deep breath, breathing exercises to turn his face bright purple. Okay. I see that. So, very much the method actor a little bit. Not to typecast him or anything, but if you want crazy, you call Brad Dorif. Exactly. You want to get nuts? Come on, let's get Yes, nuts. and there it is. Good job. Thank you. Good job, Charles. <laughs> you just had to wait for it. It's it, it just comes naturally. You don't have to you don't have to force it. It'll just happen. <laughs> don't think, just let it happen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and we're back to Twin Peaks. Exactly. Nice See how job. I brought everything full cir- full nice circle job. there. Nice job. I am so proud of you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. This is, I just, that's you great. Know. You know, sometimes I have my good nights and I have my bad nights. I hear you. So. I hear All right. Uh, this is also the first episode since the pilot where Mulder calls Scully Dana instead of Scully. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, she's going through a lot. He's being – he's he's pulling out all the stops of being the compassionate partner. You know, she lets him know that, you know, she he knew about her father. So he was right. surprised that she came into work. You know, he's like, you know, why did you even come in? I think you should you take home? some time off, Scully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. It's like your father died. I think it's okay. And she's, you know, or like, you know, then he calls her Dana. He's like, how are you doing, Dana? You know, like, okay, I'm. This is me. Yeah, this is Mulder ex- expressing concern. Right. You know, somehow, yeah. So you know what's strange, Charles? But uh, very awkwardly, of course. I don't. I don't seem to recall there being like a bunch of kids named Fox or Dana in the last 20 years. You would think I'm, – I'm sure Dana at least got some – But yeah, I'm just kind of surprised that we don't that we don't know more like – Well, Fox is a very weird name. Yeah, I know, but it's very short and kind of cool and, you know, that's the that's the thing. But uh, yeah, I'm, surpri- I'm surprised we didn't see more kids named Fox in like 1997. Right. I'm sure though that, um, you know, with Fox News that a lot of – those people would be glad that they weren't named Fox. Oh my God. Like all those by kids, their parents. like all those parents that named their daughters Khaleesi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oops. That'll age well. Yeah. The... Especially since, oh, hey, you know, she massacred the entire King's Landing. Yeah. We don't like her anymore. <laughs> yeah. Surprise. She turns out to be the bad guy. Yep. Everybody named their daughter Khaleesi. And I'm like, you know, at least it's just Khaleesi. I mean, they didn't, they didn't, uh. Yeah. Name her Daenerys. I mean, some people did actually name her name their name their kids Daenerys. I mean, so yeah, that's but now that now that now they can just call her. They'll just call their kid Danny. Yep. Something. Get away with it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. They won't call her Daenerys. They'll just call her Danny. Yep. All right. Um. So yeah. So we talked a little bit about you know Scully's father passing. Right. But interestingly, you know, the events behind his passing, very much like a Twin Peaks episode, a little bit. Yeah. You know, we talk about how, um, you know, Dina, you know, they, her parents came over for, to her apartment for dinner. They made small talk. And then, um, you know, Scully's, or Scully's father's asking her about her work and. Like very, like very, you know, forced. Formally. Yeah. He looks at, you know, he looks at the mother and she gives him the nod, like, no, ask her about her job, you know. So it's a very forced conversation. He's like. Work okay? Yeah, it's good. All right, bye. Good night. I mean, they're just yeah, ex- it's a exactly. conciliatory. They're... It's a conciliatory question, and I think a conciliatory answer. Both. It's very straightforward, very matter of fact, and then boom, they're out the door. Right. So, th- so then we pick up at like a one forty-seven in the morning at the 
you know, in the glow of the Ron Popeil commercial. Yeah, the infomercial on yep. the screen. Yeah, apparently uh, Dana gets her her Z's falling in f- asleep in front of infomercials, as we find Back out. Back then, Charles, do you remember that pretty much after 1 a.m., everything was infomercials? I know, right? Unless you were watching cable. Even cable sometimes. Pay cable. I yeah, know. even basic cable. Even now, there are times where it gets to, if it's 3 in the morning... Right. You know, I don't I don't know if it's still Ron Popeil, but it's definitely that that bald guy trying to show, sell me shark vacuum cleaners. It's, it's probably this, the my pillow guy or something. Oh god, the my pillow guy. I know, right? So apparently, you know, she wakes up and is surprised to see her father sitting in a chair near her. Just sort of sitting there, just sort of not doing anything, not saying anything, and it's very eerie it's very and he's just sort of sitting there like he's in the lodge almost he's got that same that same repose that same look well you know also like remember when he was kind of time traveling uh in the original series where you know that he's kind of sitting in this chair with vines that are everywhere and it's kind of like a weird garden and you hear kind of these you know reversed voices in the background that scene that really quick scene so you kind of get that vibe a little bit. It's almost like, you know, the, this is the chair from from uh, The Return. This is yeah, the, the chair, yep. The chair, you know, has meaning, significance here. So, again, I still think, yeah, it's Major Briggs. So It's a, it's a very Major Briggs feel to it. Yes, I agree. It should be – like if I was in college, I'd be writing a term paper on this. Seriously. Connect, connecting these dots. This is what we do. Instead of writing term papers for college, we talk about it here. Yeah, you know, it's 2020, we do podcasts about it. But, uh, yeah, you know, she's he's mouthing words, but he's not saying anything. So, again, it's very Twin Peaks. Yeah. Which I can't, with, I dug, personally. Oh, yeah. For sure. But then, you know, then things get, like, really X-Files creepy because um, there's a, a phone call. And so she goes to answer the phone, and it's her mom who's crying and, you know, very upset because... She tells Dana, well, hey, uh, your dad died. You lost your father. Lost your father of a massive coronary about an hour ago. Yep. And Dana's kind of puzzled because, like, I just saw dad here. And she turns around and sees the... He's gone. Just the chair. And then just like that, he's gone. do 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 Yeah, exactly. Very creepy. Yeah. So very... That's a very cool teaser. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was very cool and, uh, really appreciated that. But then, you know, like later we get, you know, we see her at the funeral Mm -hmm. where, you know, we, um, there's like a guy standing on like this little boat casting her father's ashes while they're playing. And this is where we get the title for the episode, kids, the 1958 Bobby Darren song, Beyond the Sea. Yep. And so we have like Dana with her mother and. Notice that her sister wasn't there, apparently, because, hey, they hadn't cast her yet. Right. And like I said, you know, we, we find out that Missy is a little bit flaky. So Just a little who, bit. Who knows yeah. where she is right now? And like I said, she has the one brother that, you know, nobody's really talking to. And Yeah. So, which we find out about when, you know, her mother gets sick. You know, spoiler alert. Pretty a strange family. Yeah. Everybody's got kind of, you know, dysfunctional. Doing family. their own thing. Do, doing their own thing, apparently. Yeah, they're very dysfunctional, I think, the families in, in this show, all of them. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, so, you know, Dana's talking about how her parents were both disappointed that she chose a different career path, and um, she wants to know if her dad was at least somewhat proud of her. And her mother does not, gives her a complete and total bullshit answer. Yeah, she's like, he was your father. He was your father. Like, does that mean yes? Does that mean you should know the answer? Does I don't know what the hell that means. Yeah, exactly. Very open to interpretation a little bit. Yep. So just give me a yes. It's a yes or no question. Give me a yes or no question, mom. I know that would be that would just make me be even more neurotic about the whole situation and just put me into more therapy. That kind of a non-committal answer. Yeah. So and then we pick up with Dana going into work and she's obviously struggling. So when um, she ends up, you know, going talking with Mulder and he's talking about the whole thing with Luther Lee Box. Mm hmm talking about you know he wrote a criminal profile about boggs and you know knows this guy and he's about to go on death row or he's about to be executed excuse me and um you know and Mulder's trying to think well hey you know 
you shouldn't even be here today. Not even supposed to be here today. But but Scully is um, Scully's you know adamant that she can handle it that she wants to focus on her work she right needs, now. She needs to work. Yeah, and some people are like that. I get that. Yeah. But uh, Mulder talks about the case. He says he claims to have uh, obtained information regarding an abduction mm-hmm. of these of these two teenagers that we see saw a little bit earlier in the episode. That essentially, you know, they were making out in a car uh, in the university in North Carolina, and there's a guy, you know, posing as a cop. Yeah. Knocks on the steamed up window. Mm-hmm. And the guy who the, – the the male teen makes the big mistake of getting out of the car before asking for ID. You don't get out of the car. Don't get out of the damn car, no. idiot. Mm-mm. Did you not watch Seven? <laughs> Or no, 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 I'm not sorry. I'm sorry. Not Zo- seven. Zodiac. Did you not watch Zodiac? Zodiac. Yeah, that's another one. Don't get out of the car. Don't get out of the car. Anyway, so so apparently, you know, like these kids have been abducted. And uh, but somehow Boggs knows something about this. And he's claiming that, um, you know, he's he's got a psychic connection to this. But Mulder is skeptical about it. So Mulder gives him. A piece of cloth from the crime scene, and he mm-hmm. gives this great performance. And then Mulder says, "I just ripped this off of my Knicks T-shirt, so you're, I'm going to bust you on this when you're lying." Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty clever on his part. Yeah, because because uh, um, Boggs gives this you know big over the top theatrical performance. You're like, oh, you know, I I see this and I see this, and oh, there's pain and suffering, and mm-hmm. he really tries to sell it. And then you know when after Mulder walks out. And Scully's alone. That's when he starts singing. And this is where he gets all X Files creepy. Yeah, he starts singing "Beyond the Sea" to himself. Yeah, he knows. He knows uh, Scully can hear him. Yeah, but that's about it. And uh, you know, and, and then he asks her if um, he calls her Starbuck. Calls her Starbuck, and it says if she received his message. Mm-hmm. Which we're assuming is him in the chair. And it's kind of here at this point, I think, that the episode kind of takes a Silence of the Lambs vibe. Very much so, because then she's... With obviously Scully playing the role of Cleary Starling and Boggs being Dr. Lecter. In this right, show. because he's trying to, he's like, you know, do you want to know what your father has to tell you? And she's trying to get, he's like, no, nobody talks to anyone until I get a deal. So she comes in with a fake deal, just exactly yes. like Cleary Starling. So it is very, it is very Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. You know, they try to do this newspaper trick, and um, they try to trick him Which into... Which is very Red Dragon. Yeah, exactly. They think that Boggs is in on it. Yeah. Well, because they, they thought initially that um, the guy who did commit the crime was doing it with Boggs, but they could never prove it. Right. So this is their way of trying to prove that these two guys are, in fact, working together. So then it, it essentially becomes like, like I said, it's Silence of the Lambs where instead of Dr. Lecter trying to, to track down Buffalo, helping Clarice track down Buffalo Bill. Or the Tooth Fairy. Or the Tooth Fairy, exactly, from Red Dragon. That um, it's essentially, you know, Box trying to help Scully track down um, this Lucas Henry guy. And it's Mulder in the role of Jack Crawford saying, do not let bogs inside your head <laughs> you're exactly um uh, and suddenly I, I picture scott's glenn's voice in my head that's great <laughs> he's so good in that i love him as jack crawford so good eh, he's still scott glenn you know <laughs> <laughs> he's eh. he's not my favorite jack crawford by any means so. Who, who's your favorite jack jack crawford lawrence fishburne oh on hannibal mm-hmm. yeah yep. yeah he's my favorite good jack point. crawford yeah He's up there. And I, I think say, he's my I, like, I think he's my I think he's my number two. I like uh Harvey Keitel too. I think Harvey Keitel did a good job. Yeah, he did all right. Scott Glenn just okay creeps with... me out. I don't know what it is about Scott Glenn, but I just But that's why I thought he was perfect for that role he, in that movie. He is kinda he is kinda he is kinda good in that role and he adds a level of lechery to yeah. that role. Well, like the the scene where, where Hannibal Lecter is saying, you know, he's you know I know this is digressing into Silence of the Lambs talk, but but yeah. He, he's saying, you know, Jack Crawford is, you know, do you think he imagines, you know, scenarios with you? And he just gets all, he gets all yes. nasty with it. And I'm just sort of like, I think Scott Glenn would. 
I know. Scott Glenn, I would believe that. Well, I think I think he was trying to, you know, push Scully or Scully Starling a little bit. Yeah, he was stiff and 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 it doesn't And trying to see which trying to see how if she had some kind of, you know, metal M E T T L E inside her. Yeah, and she says just, you know, that does, that doesn't interest me, doctor. It's something that Miggs would say and then he says my favorite Hannibal Lecter line in the history right. of Hannibal Lecter lines, which is not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So, but yeah, I do feel like Scott Glenn probably is a little more in the, the Scott Glenn Jack Crawford is probably a little more into Clarice Starling in a creepy way than he should be, just because he's Scott Glenn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. If, I can't see him actually making a move on Scully. Or I keep calling her Scully. See, because it, I know it's easy to compare the two. I can't see him making the move Charles, on Starling. You've got to get these names straight because there's room for more than one beautiful woman in the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Obviously, yes. See, I brought yes. it back to Twin Peaks for you. How do you like that? You did. You did. You did a fantastic job. I did a good job yes. at that. Yeah, I give you points for that. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. points. So let's see. So um, they they try this uh, newspaper trick that fails, and Scully ends up. You know, she goes out driving. And comes across, you know, some landmarks where uh, Box supposedly gave his – had his vision of the team's location. Mm -hmm. And he's right, though. That's the thing. He's kind of right. I know. Exactly. And that's kind of why they think that, that Box is in on it. Yeah. Because because the clues lead her to this warehouse where she finds, um, what, one of the victims? Mm -hmm. Or I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm kind of mixing this up. They found a necklace – or charm or something, and then later on, they uh, pretty shortly thereafter, they they find the girl, right? And then this is where you know, like they 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 get there almost in time to get the kidnapper. But that's when he shoots Mulder. That's that's when he shoots Mulder. Yeah. yeah. So that was a little later when she was back with Mulder. Right, but that's the thing. So it's like he's in on it, and they're you know they're they're tracking his weekly phone call. Yeah, and it's like, is he in on this, or is he just getting up to you? You actually never find out in this episode because no, he does get executed, and we and we never really, we never really see it. We we yeah. never really get a, and we never hear what he has to say to Scully, so we never really find out. But he's he's like right. So is he? When you combine that with him being right about Scully's dad, is he actually psychic, or? Is he just in on it, you know? And he's he's on to them, too, because they're trying to figure yeah. out – they put that fake news story. Again, very, you know, very Jack Crawford thing to do. Yeah. Um, Jack Crawford, Will Graham move right there. Um, they put the fake news story and, out. And Red Dragon, yeah. Yep. He reads it, and then he uses his weekly phone call, and they think he's going to call his accomplice, but he calls Mulder. <laughs> Yes. He calls Mulder's cell phone. Right. And he's kind of like waving to him on the camera because he he's like, he's why are you watched. messing with me? <laughs> yes. It's like, you're just wasting time. You're just wasting time. And I don't think those kids, TikTok, TikTok. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It gets all very Watchmen there. Time's time. running out for little Catherine. TikTok, TikTok. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yes. So they go back to Silence of the Lambs. Back to, so, yeah. It's a very Silence of the lambs type of a type of it. Yeah. Uh, of an episode. Yeah. So we have... Oh, let's see here. Silence so, of the Lambs, by the way, featuring Chris Isaac, so it is tangentially Twin Peaks related, so we can talk about it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to be looking forward to our Silence of the Lambs episode of Ghostwood. Yeah, well, we we, we need that. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. I'm okay. I'm okay I think it that. might be this episode. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know you guys are going to be doing that on Gold Standard eventually, but that's going to be like what 2050 at this rate. Yeah, every let's see uh, every. You know, tw so twenty. We're going to do twenty six episodes a year. We're on nineteen thirty four. Yeah, it's going to be a couple of years. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. It's going to so, be a couple of years before we get to that one. So it might be a while before you guys get. To you didn't that snag one. that one as guest, did you? Oh yes, I did. Did you get that one? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I was like, okay, I want Silence of the Lambs. I like, at first, I wanted Casablanca. That was taken. Yeah, but I thought, do you got the Godfather? Did you get but the Godfather? I got the, I got the, I got the Godfathers, okay. and and I said uh, Silence of the Lambs. That's what I wanted. Okay, because I, yeah, I, I was pretty. I was, I knew you had the Godfather, but I couldn't remember if you had snagged Silence of the Lambs or not. Yeah, yeah. I, oh yeah, I love that. Good job. I want, <laughs> I was all over that. Um, so that's my consolation for not getting Casablanca. I guess. Um, You're so much better off. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Not a Casablanca I mean, it, fan. I, I mean, we'll talk about really? it later, but not a huge Casablanca fan. No. Uh-uh. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I love that movie. I don't like Claude Rains. I don't like Claude Rains. I've said it a million times. Yeah. I will die on this hill. I don't like Claude Rains. But it's so good in that movie. He's, but he's, ugh, I just, ugh, whatever. I'm shocked that gambling is going on here. Shocked, I tell shocked. you. Shocked. <laughs> it's an iconic line. That's why I love uh, Notorious so much. It has a gr- great ending. <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> great ending. So, uh, so Box ends up, um, so he's, he's essentially biting it. Now he's getting very close to his time being executed. And he's developed this, you know, I don't want to say it more like a, a dialogue. He's, it's not like exactly any kind of relationship by any means. It's more of a, it's, it's still adversarial, but he's thanking her. And he talks about uh, the other victim's location, revealing that he's held in this, the, the Blue Devil Brewery. Mm-hmm. And, and that Lucas Henry's preparing to kill him. Right. So Scully's about to admit the, to Boggs that she lied regarding his deal, but then he finishes her sentence for her, admitting that he knew that – he already knew that she did. He says, if you, she, she says, lied. if you were really psychic, he says, I would know there was no deal. <laughs> yeah. Like he totally, he totally knew. Just the way I think Hannibal Lecter knew. You know, you know go swimming? No, I'm sorry. He hasn't even seen the outside in, in eight years. Yeah. Let alone. But he warns her to avoid the devil. So something that, you know, obviously that pays off later because, surprise, you know, Scully ends up going there, confronting Lucas Henry Mm -hmm. just as he's getting his axe on. Yeah. And not the body spray. And he's about ready to kill um, Jim, the the victim, the other victim, the male victim. Right. And and, uh, she shoots, you know, she goes over there. There's a chase. It leads to a catwalk, and she lowers her gun when she sees the the giant uh, blue painted devil behind Henry Lucas Henry. Beware the devil! Beware the devil! And then, of course, that's that moment where a section of wooden boarding gives way, mm-hmm. causing him to fall to his death. Yeah. So, and there's then there's like a really cool tra- scene transition where they do that close up on. Uh, the blue devil's face, and you know, and then and then uh, Luther Lee Boggs' face kind of comes into view. Right, and you could say that he's saying, you know, it's at the Blue Devil Brewery. Beware the devil. I mean, he's probably he could be just messing with you. Yeah, but he's very Hannibal Lecter. You know, look deep within yourself. Kind of a statement that he's he sounds he sounds trite, but he he really has a lot to say. So, yeah. what is up with Boggs? Exactly. And uh, it's very left, very like you said, it's left very ambiguously. You're not quite sure, you know, was he legit? Was he not? But uh, that, you know, it makes it, I think it makes things more creepier that way, that you don't quite know. And you, you can end up kind of kind of debating that a little bit right. in your head. Right. You, you never find out and you you always wonder, like, what, yeah. what, what is it? You know, what is, is he, is he live or Memorex? You have no idea. Yeah. So after every, you know, everything. This is all said and done. Boggs is about to be executed, and he goes, okay, you know, I've got one final message from your dad, but I'm not going to tell you what it is unless you show up at my execution. And she, and she doesn't? She, she stiffs him on it, yeah. She stiffs him on it, and it, it's like for like a tenth of a second you feel bad for him because he has that line where he says, do not underestimate my fear of – what does he say? Of the needle of the of of death or something I forget, but he's he yeah afraid. I know I know what you're talking about yeah he's yeah. afraid of dying and so you know he's he's asking her for a favor I mean he's he's asking her I will give you this thing that you want because I really really need somebody to be there with me yeah. it's like you be my witness and she doesn't do it and you can see there is just terrified fear in his in his face. So yeah. you feel bad for him for about 10 seconds. Now, if you listen to Mulder, that there are some, you know, some killers are created by society, but then some people are just bad seeds. So mm-hmm. you could you could think that about Boggs, but I, I felt bad for him for like a tenth of a second when, when she stiffed him. Well, I think you were supposed to, yeah. but, but 
I think it's credit to Scully that she didn't give him what he wanted. I, right. She doesn't. She doesn't fall for it. She doesn't fall for it. Yeah. She doesn't succumb to it because because we because she had no way of knowing that you know one there was actually a message from her father. Yeah. She right. And two, you know, she had no idea of knowing that if there was a message, well, was it legit? I mean, or, you know that. Or, or rather, you know, was it worth being there? For? See, and here's another level to that. Would she actually want to hear it? That's another thing. Yeah, because we know that she had problems with her father. Right. Was the message, I'm disappointed that you didn't become a medical doctor. Is that the message? She doesn't know. So now. Yeah, like, that's all I needed. I need guilt from the grave. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, guilt Fox. from the grave. Nobody needs that. So now it might be ambiguous and she tells Mulder that she knows what his message was because he was her father. <laughs> so we have exactly. the same line, but now it can be what she thinks it was not what he's going to tell her it was. And because it's Boggs, he probably would have screwed with her. Yeah. So and, just and it's screw with Scully's her. credit. It's Scully's credit that she takes back control of the situation. Yes. Yes. Very much so. She doesn't succumb to his parlor tricks, shall we say. Exactly. Or his desperation mm -hmm. in this case, because he was so desperate to to have someone be there in his final moment. Right. And right. so um, she good, checks back with Mulder, who's still recuperating from getting shot earlier. And she's this is where she kind of starts to second guess herself and go like, well, maybe the case could have been arranged by Boggs all along. So she kind of slips back into the skeptic mode. Right. She's now that it's she kinda over. Hit, she kind of hit. She kind of hits the reset button. A little right. Bit. It's all over. They saved the kids. They. She's had time to, you know, she's going through the process. She's processed. She's processed it. it. She's gone through the stages of grief. She's gone through, and you see her go through bargaining, anger. Fear. She goes through them all. The, the, that scene yep. where she's screaming at him, like I will flip the switch on you myself, you son of a bitch. I mean, and she's and she goes through bargaining to try and get him to tell her. I mean, she goes through all of the stages of grief. And that's a good that's a good observation. And finally, at the end, it's finally acceptance. Like we've mm -hmm. we saved the kids. Boggs was executed. This is this is what needs to happen. My father has passed. I know what he had to say. I know how he felt about me. I'm good. I let's let what's our next case, Mulder? Yeah. So now she now she does in an interesting moment. I thought she admits to that the reason um, she's afraid to believe, and Mulder's kind of you know stunned by this. Like you know if if ask her if she couldn't overcome the fear, mm -hmm. even if it meant learning that what her father had been trying to tell her. And she says, well, I already know what it, what he would have said. Well, how do you know? He was my father. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And so she's ex – that's acceptance, and that's yep. the final stage. Yep. So that's a very good observation on your part. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, she went through those stages of grief. Yeah, and we, and and we see them. We, we see them. Yep. yep. You know, dis right. disbelief, with, you know, like with uh, – no, this can't be. I just saw him. I mean, everything. She goes yep. through them all. Yep, she does. And you're right. And you know, the rage, bargaining, that whole, mm -hmm. all that's there. Yep. Exactly. All right. Uh, anything else about this episode that we didn't cover? Um, no, nothing, nothing really. Cause we're still in the, you know, the embryonic stages of the X Files yeah. that, you know, yeah. that we come to know and love. The X Files, like season three, which is when I think this, the series really starts to, you know, like, like most, like most I'd, seasons. I'd say, I'd say, I'd say season two, it really starts to. Yeah, die. like halfway through two, I think you're probably, well, no, that's, no, second episode of two is host, right? And that's my favorite one, so I'll give it. Yeah. yeah. So we're still working on building up to what uh, X-Files should yeah. be, but it's still gotten, yeah. you know, I'm still in high school. Where am I going on a Friday night? You know, <laughs> so I'm still watching it. Aw. Well, no, I'm, I have a bunch of friends who are nerds, and what are we doing? We're watching the X-Files. Juice is probably at my house, and we're probably watching the X-Files. Well, nothing wrong with that. No, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong I'm just, with that at I'm all. I'm just saying, you know, there's a, there's, you know, there's a curfew. I can't go out drinking. It's not like I'm I pooping it up, okay. you know. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. That and I was a painful introvert, afraid of people. So that helps <laughs> that there was TV. 
Well, join the club. Yeah, right. Because I was exactly the same way. Only I was hanging out with Lori at the time. So, all right. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, you and Lori have known each other a long time. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Uh, it's not the years; it's the mileage. So. <laughs> yep. Um, you're not the man. So she, what, what, you're not the man she knew ten was, years ago. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, now we slipped into Raiders quotes. Um, so easy to do, though. It is. It is. It is. Um, I just love. I love the direction in this one. I love the atmosphere in this one. Um, it does have that Silence of the Lambs vibe, but. The field it where it works, but it's supposed to really. Yeah, the field where I died aside. Yes. Morgan and Wong know what they're doing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I did not like that episode. No, we do. I, I think agree. that is that is universal, and I feel bad. Um, because that's sort of universally thought of. As, I thought didn't didn't um Duchovny have a hand in the script on that one? I don't even remember. But it's I can't it, remember either. It's sort of universally seen as the worst episode. Of, um, of the X Files. Yeah. But I thought, what's her name? Who I cannot think of her name right now, but she's Glenn Morgan's wife. What's her name? I don't know. Ha! Ah! Um, I have to look it up now. No, I think she did. I now. think she did a really good job in that episode. Yeah. Um. So it's it's sad that you know that's such a bad episode, but she does such a good job. Yeah. Um. But yeah, normally, normally Glenn Morgan and James Wong are are fantastic writers for the X Files. Yeah, exactly. It's usually, turn in some of the greatest scripts. Uh, this Kristen Cloak. Obviously... I could not think of her name. It was I could oh okay. See, I could see her face, but I could not hmm. think of her name. It's ridiculous. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. but yeah, she's married to Glenn Morgan. I didn't, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, they they uh, got married around. Learning this, a lot today. Yeah, they got married around the space above and beyond era of. Uh, Oh yeah, I lo- I used to love that show. Yeah, um, that was also produced by Glenn Morgan, James Wong, obviously. Yep. But uh, um, do you know who he used to be married to? No. Cindy Morgan from Tron. From from Tron, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Wow, and Caddyshack. And Caddyshack, yes, of course. I keep forgetting yeah. that yeah. most most men know yes. her from Caddyshack. Most men know her from Caddyshack. Yeah. But I know I know her from Tron too. Okay. Yep. So. Give me a little credit here. I'm a big Tron guy. Yep. So, so right. um All right. So what's your rating for this one? My rating for this one I think is probably eight out of ten Christmas tree angels that I haven't taken down yet. <laughs> and I give it that that rating because of I mean, I'll just be honest, because of Brad Dorif. And I love Brad Dorif. Okay. Yeah. Um it gets a, it gets some points for having Don Davis because I love Don Davis. Right. And it gets some points for having it being an interesting an interesting Scully episode. It's a very deep dive into Scully's psyche. And so it definitely gets points for that. Well, all three of the reasons that you mentioned are exactly why I give it 9 out of 10 scraps of Mulder's New York Knicks t-shirt. Oh, that's a good one. Thank you. I like that. Yeah, but I I really like this episode. It's yeah. It's essentially it feels almost like the first the first real home run of X Files. See, for that, me, the first from, real home run for X Files is Eve. That's a good one, and that's like episode think, six. I, like this I think. One, I li- yeah, I like this one better, but Eve is good. Eve was my favorite of the first season, and, and then obviously Squeeze. Oh, squeeze is weird, <laughs> but it's a great, great one. Though. It's a great one. So, but but I really this is, like yeah, this. Eve I mean, is episode eleven, there, I, and for me, I Eve think, is where it is where yeah. it really hit hit its mark for me. So. I, I think for me, I think for me, this one kind of hits on all cylinders. You got great writing, you have fantastic directing, and you have obviously a fantastic guest cast in the form of oh yeah Don Don Davis and Brad Dorif. Oh, you cannot. Go wrong. And you get the in, Don Davis you get the introduction to, of Scully's mom, so that has impact. And um, and it, and like you said, it's the first real episode where Scully takes center stage. Right, right. And, and it I, becomes a, I think it becomes the template for all the great Scully episodes to follow. I think so too. I think so too. 
Yeah, I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at season one, and uh, fantastic job by Jillian Anderson. Oh, fantastic, Jillian Anderson, who is so what good. is she? She's playing uh, Margaret Thatcher on The Crown, which means yep. I'm going to have to start watching The Crown again. Oh, I never stopped. It's great. I started and then I got involved in something in something else, but it was one of those where Chris was watching it and then I watched like five episodes in one night. Like I was like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. And hey, if any of you Doctor Who fans out there want to see Matt Smith's bare ass, yep, it's there. The crown is here for you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's there. He's fantastic <laughs> in seasons one and two. Oh, he's so fantastic being Prince Philip, he's, who is it, such a and douche. He's, he's, Exactly. Yeah, Philip, Prince, Prince Philip, such a dick. Such a douche. <laughs> yes. Talk about needing he, Axe body spray. Yeah. Right? Pretty much. He probably, well, he probably, hell, he probably invented it, but. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah. Um, now, we may be kind of wrapping up on this one a little bit early, but we have a lot of feedback to talk about. Well, if we got a lot to talk about, Sheriff, let's do it. Exactly. So, um,. Not one, not two, but three people writing in this time for Beyond the Sea. Fantastic. So, which is great. And um, all of uh, whom are very well known to us. So, uh, coming in first, Jesse Jackson, coming in all the way from Texas. Um, I hope Jesse's doing okay down there in Hurricane yeah. Lands. Well, he apparently it's, you know, he's around the Dallas area, so it kind of went east of him. Yeah, but, but he was concerned. He was concerned because his mom is in Lake Charles. Yeah, and they which got slammed. Lake Charles got slammed, and Texas can get some blowback when when yeah. you have that Gulf effect. Texas, right. I mean, we feel it. I mean, we feel that we eventually feel it too. But Texas can get yeah. some blowback too. So, um, yeah. but yeah, Lake Charles definitely got got hit pretty bad. So, so so hopefully Jesse's mom's okay. I still have to check back with him about that. Yeah, we got to talk. Um, so, he, so he writes in, hi, Zan and Charles. Hi, Jesse. Oh, Zan. Zan gets top billing. All right. Uh, well, technically Zan, I'm, f- I'm first alphabetically, so. You have an X and I have a C. No, How I mean, because I'm an A. Oh, that's right. You are. Yeah. For those of you who you... don't know, Zan. Yeah is a nickname for Alexandra. My legal name right. is Alexandra. Right. You would not believe how many people think my actual name is Xanadu. <laughs> it's it's true. Because I, I say that yep. in order for people I, to know how to spell it, I yeah. say it's Xan like Xanadu. So people just think that's my name. So Well, you, you, you know, your um, your Twitter handle is like, you know, Udinax19. Which is so, yeah. Xanadu spelled backwards. Yeah. Exactly. So, All right. So, uh, all right. You're right. Alphabetically, it is not that Jesse uh, knows that, but I'm just I'm just saying. <laughs> no, I'm I'm sure I I I would bet a hundred dollars easy that he did not know that. No, he had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. So uh, he goes, "Thanks for reading my letter in the last episode." Well, you're very welcome, Jesse. Thanks for writing us a letter about the last episode. Exactly. I was not a canine fan, but I have changed my ways. Fantastic. Because we pressured him. But Peer pressure. Okay. We'll, t- but, we'll but take what we can get. All we're doing is pressuring him, pressuring him to have more joy in his life because yeah. canine is nothing but sheer joy. Well, you know, like everybody kind of ganged up on him and threatened him. And go like, you know, it's canine. What the hell is your problem? Canine is like sacred. Like you can't. <laughs> exactly. Like, you don't, that's like you don't saying, mess- you know, I don't really like Kermit the Frog. Like you can't say that. No. <laughs> like no, tell me you're no. not a big fan of the Muppets. Okay. That's one exactly. thing. To not be all that into the Muppets, but to just not like Kermit the Frog, you just can't say that out loud in a crowd of people and expect it to go unnoticed. Yeah, so Jesse continues, in fact, when I was fighting colon cancer, Charles and Lori sent me a canine figure so that he could laser out the cancer. Cancer, And he and he, and he do it, and we too. Did. Yeah. Yeah, we did. I keep it on my desk at work to remind me of the love of both of them. And, he, of course, he sends an attached photo. Awesome. So awesome. Yep. So uh, it says, now onto the episode. One thing that this series has done so far is to use some wonderful character actors in supporting roles. Don Davis is the reason you picked this episode. He is memorable in Twin Peaks. Well, yeah, but you haven't watched Twin Peaks, so shame on you for that. Well, uh, there's only so many great... hours in the day, you know, and I, 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 know, I get I it, Jesse, but you know what? There's not that many hours of Twin Peaks, unfortunately. Priorities, man. I'm just yeah. saying. Uh, he was greatest conservative preacher in the West Wing. I didn't realize he was on that show. And uh, Senator Ellis in the Dead Zone. Uh-huh. And, of course, 
on Stargate SG-1, another blind spot in my genre viewing history. Uh, we're right there. Don't feel, we're feeling exactly. around in the dark right there with you, Jesse, both of us. That one you, that one you get a pass on because neither of us. Well, a pass from us. I'm sure there's some yeah. – there's, there's you know, Aunt, Aunts Patty and Selma are out there ready to murder us <laughs> for not, not watching Richard Dean Anderson. MacGyver. 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 <laughs> Based on IMDb, it looks like he didn't make many appearances as Scully's father, and that seems a shame. Yes. I agree. Yes. He had two uh, families. Hey, they, they, they killed him off in this episode, so it's not like he had, you know. Yeah, he had two families, one in Washington, D.C., one in Washington State. Unless they did flashbacks. I guess they could use him that way. Yeah. Uh, one of my previous entertainment blind spots was Deadwood, and I watched that earlier this year in time to watch the enjoy the Deadwood movie, which was no. good. I, okay. I admit I liked it. Uh, the great Brad Dorff played Doc Cochran in that series, and he was one of my favorite characters. Because he's Brad Dorff. Mo- yep. Exactly. He is mostly known for the, being the voice of Chucky, yep. but I will remember him as Brother Edward in the brilliant Babylon 5 episode, Passing Through Gethsemane. So you want to know and, something strange, Charles? And I'm sure I've yeah. told you this before. Yeah. You know how I'm like this massively huge Bruce Boxleitner fan? You have not watched Babylon 5. Never got into Babylon 5. Yep. Yep. I understand. Um, highly recommended, though. We have them the all. And Chris, Just skip skip to season two because that's when Box Lightner joins. Chris keeps trying. He's like, he's like, it's yeah. Box Lightner in every episode. I'm like, I know. I just. He's I just, really good. That's probably the, one of my favorite things he's been in ever. Well, um, we all know the best thing he's been in. But Well, yeah, that was Tron, man. Scarecrow, so. Mrs. King. No, I'm just kidding. No, it was Tron. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I friggin. Yeah. <laughs> Such a ridiculous yeah. premise, but I loved it. Yeah. Uh, he is so creepy in this episode as the serial killer, Luther Lee Boggs. Always beware of people with three names. Well, yeah, most serial killers have that three name thing going. Very true. Yep, very true. Yeah. Uh, this episode had a different tone than the pilot, much more creepy and moody, which, in my opinion, always makes for better. Yes. Uh, that's me personally saying that. Uh, the plot is good, he continues, but the highlight of the episode is seeing Dana Scully deal with the grief of losing her father and the conflict of this killer pretending, or is he, to have a connection to her father's spirit. Mm-hmm. The ending was vague enough to leave me wondering if Boggs was lying or not. See? Yep. Jesse's, Jesse's on it's our big lane, man. Exactly. You're, in, you're dialed in. Yep. Uh, the partnership between our two leads has developed nicely, and it was good to hear or to see their blossoming friendship. On a side note, I love Bobby Darren's music and the reference to his classic made me smile and creep me out when Boggs is singing it. And he says, if you haven't had a chance to hear him perform The Curtain Falls, please check it out. And he gives a YouTube link. Nice. And he goes, I'm giving this episode 8 out of 10 Blue Devil signs. Oh, good one. Keep, keep hope alive, Jesse Jackson. Thank you, Jesse. So, yes, Jesse, thank you for writing in, obviously – Jesse being my partner on Next Stop Everywhere and the Phantom Zone and others. So, um, you know, uh, appreciate you writing in. And and uh, obviously, we're definitely keeping your mom in our thoughts regarding this hurricane. Oh, for sure. So, Lake Charles, better that, than living in Hackensack, but not good right yeah. now. Yeah, we had, a, we had a nice little commiseration about that. He, I, you know, he talked about how his mom was riding out the hurricane. And I go, she's riding out of Category 4 hurricane. This is before it smacked into the Yeah. And yeah. I go and I just did a face palm and he's like, Yes, exactly. Face uh-huh. palm. Yeah. My God. So so, uh, so so our so our thoughts are with you on that one. Uh second writing in, of course, uh Holly Mack writing in once again. It's great to hear from Holly. Always good to hear from, from Holly. The tolerant ho- ho- the tolerant Holly. <laughs> yes, yeah, the one that keeps calling out Zan. I'm just kidding. Well, when um, you know what? If I'm wrong, she's supposed to tell me I'm wrong. Right. That's the thing. Okay. That's fair. Yeah, as long as she's fair about it. Yep. You know? So Holly, Holly from Wisconsin writing in, hey, Charles and Zan, love the pilot episode review of The X-Files. Well, thank you. Uh, before I get to my review, just a brief side tangent. I'm pretty good at those, smiley face. We're so, so good at those. We're, 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 we're experts at it. So yep. we, we define it. Uh, about how I got into the X Files. I went to a book signing for the author Kevin J. Anderson, nice, who, who has written many Star Wars and X Files novels. Mm-hmm. This is while he was writing his first X Files novel, and told a few people in line not to spoil the episode for him. Oh, 
FYI, his X-Files novels are great. I agree with that because I have them. Um, so uh, so I, I'm definitely with Holly on that one. Uh, this was around the tail end of season three. So my interest being sparked uh, started with season three, and this was before streaming services. Mm-hmm. Th- thankfully, Fox around the time um, I was watching season three and waiting for season four had put out the best of VHS three packs, slowly but surely. Oh, those, I remember three, those. Three episodes on each tape. Yep. And there was probably still a blockbuster at the time. So even if you didn't buy them, you could probably rent them. Yep. Yep. So I was able to catch up for the most part. Thank heavens for my DVDs of the season now. Uh, okay. Now onto the review. Brad Dorff was great as Luther Lee Box, And whenever I see him again in a different role, I would always be a little leery. Just like a certain agent with the eight initials AK, mm. meaning meaning Alex Krychek, of course. Yes, yes. Yeah, played of course by Nicholas Lee. Yes, yes, yes. Which I which uh, I will remember now. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never forget that now. Um, the tension between Mulder and Scully when she went to where Box had said to find the charm. Mulder with his trick with a fake newspaper article was a stroke of brilliance to find out if Box had someone on the outside helping him. The scene between Scully and Boggs where when Mulder was in the hospital was awesome. Boggs warning Scully about Henry. I didn't see coming the first time I watched this episode. The looks on look on Boggs's face when Scully didn't show up and then tr- her trying to rationalize what she had first believed as Boggs doing research and her admitting that she was afraid. Yeah. Really, really nice to see at 13 episodes into the first season that the relationship between the two of them is growing and that they are starting to trust each other and respect each other. I'll wrap it up here. Holly, the lone gun woman from Wisconsin. Oh, nice. Thanks, Holly. And then she, and then she attaches photos of her autographed X-Files novels. That is super and cool. To, Antibodies and ruins. Nice. From of course, yep. I only have by Kevin J. Anderson. I only have one Kevin J. Anderson autograph, and it yeah. was uh, Clockwork Angels, mm. um, the novel he wrote with uh, Neil Pert from Rush. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. That's cool. And I will never get it signed by Neil Pert, which makes <laughs> me sad. <laughs> yeah, that is that's depressing. That's very depressing. Not like um, Neil yeah, Pert I... ever does public appearances or did public appearances yeah. other than like, hi, I play by, I'm not signing shit, but still yeah. it makes me sad that it's like literally impossible now. I've had, I was fortunate enough. I've, I've run into him several times. So I've got like X-Files novels signed by him. I've got star Wars, young Jedi Knights novels. Signed Heck by him, yeah. Uh, which was a great series back in the day. Yeah, I've, I've read a lot um, of star Wars stuff. And it, yeah, some of it, I think a couple, I think dark saber I've got autographed. Nice. I recall correct. And then um, the last son of Krypton, or no, the, the, yeah, the last days of Krypton. That's it. The last days of Krypton okay. novel that he did, cool, uh, which was very cool. It's you know obviously about everything leading up to the destruction of Krypton, and in the, in the Superman legend and the Superman mythos, and uh, it, it was told really really well. So highly underrated novel. I I definitely recommend uh, checking that out if you can. Uh, lastly, of course. Well, it wouldn't be, you know, one of our episodes if, uh, hey, DJ Nick didn't write in. DJ DJ Nick is a staple. Exactly. He, you know, does the asterisk thing once again, selects a cigarette and lights up. Oh, my goodness. Flick. <sighs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, ahoy, dear Charles and Zan. So I, I should do it in the, in the Nick voice. Ahoy, dear Charles and Zan. Don't do your impression of Nick. <laughs> no, apparently his – Nick's girlfriend's – uh, loved it. Really? That's hilarious. Yes, he told me this. He's <laughs> like, she thought she thought I was dead on. That so, is funny. Uh, that is. That funny. is funny. I said I would have done more. Zan would have let me, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, Beyond the Sea is probably one of the greatest episodes in the entire X Files franchise for many reasons, and I will try to keep this short. One, Don Davis does a fantastic job as Captain William Scully, and through the exchanges. Between him and Dana, are, are, excuse me, and though the exchanges between him and Dana are brief, we can certainly tell there is a very strong bond between the two. And only 13 episodes in, we already get the quite the heart tugger for sure. Mm-hmm. Two, 
the amazing Brad Dorf as Luther Lee Boggs, Heck yeah. whom, I, whom I am sure you will have mentioned is another Lynchian tie for him being in Blue, Blue Velvet. And he doesn't add that, but also Dune. Also Dune. And also Dune. Don't forget Dune. Uh, I love the Clary Starling Hannibal Lecter vibe we got between the two and a heck of a wreck. A heck. I think he means uh, a heck of a redhead talking to a serial killer. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Could it be any more blatantly perfect? Not to mention, as a fan of true crime, I also did like the nods to the notorious killer, Henry Lee Lucas, mm-hmm. with both Boggs and Lucas Henry. Not to mention how uncannily Luther Lee resembles Richard the Night Stalker Ramirez. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Richard Ramirez, who got married in prison once. I mean, yeah. what is wrong with people? How long do you, how long of a day do you have to talk about that? Because it's a pretty long list. Richard Ramirez and Paul Bernardo can get wives in prison. Yeah, yeah. you know, I th- honestly these these incels yeah. have no excuse. <laughs> yeah, I know. If Paul this, Bernardo at this can get point, married I, in prison, then it's the incels at, just need to shower. That's all I'm saying. At this point, at this point, I would start playing um, "Cult of Personality" by Living Color. There you go. Yeah, as my response. Uh huh. Um, this up. So Nick continues. This episode works great as a standalone episode as well. It's a must-see for anybody who enjoys crime thrillers for sure. I give it 9 out of 10 Starbucks. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. Yes. Yep. So he does the asterisk, puts out cigarette. You two are ever amazing. Big hugs and don't stop believing. Your smoking man. <laughs> P- DJ, well, you know, and then he says, P.S., which is your favorite version of Beyond the Sea song? I am partial. I am particularly partial to the Rod Stewart and Barry Manilow versions, along with, of course, the original Bobby Darin version, and of course the French song, which gave this great this great tune inspiration, oh, Le Mer, the, by yeah. by Charles Trenet. Mm-hmm. Well, interesting, interesting story, DJ Nick. Yeah, Nick about uh, La Mer. Yeah. Uh, when I, um, actually around the time this episode came out, I worked at a French restaurant, uh, that was run by a French couple who had moved here and made it to Ohio by way of Colorado. I don't remember exactly how they did that, but, uh, um, they were wonderful couple, very nice people, but there was French music all the time. And I probably there was heard, always music in the air. There's always exactly the birds sang a pretty song, and there was always music in the air. And I think I heard La Mer twice a day for probably about a year. So if oh. I never hear, so now you're burned, you're burned out on it. If I never hear that version of that song again, it will be too soon. So it's a yeah. it's a good one, but I'm very tired of it because I heard it <laughs> at work a lot, um, over and over and over. But the original Bobby Darren version of it reminds me of my mom. So that one's yeah. totally my favorite. Well, it's, it's funny, you know. The only I'm not, I'm not as into this song, but you know, I love the Bobby Darren version of it mm-hmm. because it reminds me of this episode. Oh, okay, okay. So every time I hear the song, I think of this episode. See, I think of I think of driving around with my mom and like okay. her playing her because you know my mom would play mixtapes of songs from her records and things like that. And this was okay. one that she really liked. It was this one and, uh, um, Mac, the knife were yeah. two of my mom's favorites from Bobby Darren. And so it just, it makes me, uh, it reminds me of her. So. Yeah. That, you know, uh, we used to listen to in, we did high school German class. We listened to the Mackie Messer song, which is the uh, German version of Mac, the knife. Nice. That's so, a good one. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I couldn't even begin to start reciting that one for you. So I've kind of blocked all I've kind of blocked all that German out of my memory most of for the most part. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's nice that you have a great personal memory. Yeah. With this associated with this song. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm kind of envious with you on that one. Because <laughs> all I have is just like, hey, I remember this X Files episode that I really liked. Gotcha. Yeah. No, this is so the ne- song I knew really. Well not nearly. This episode came out. So. Yeah, not nearly as important. I'm afraid. Yeah. But uh, everybody, uh, so Jesse, Holly, and Nick, thank you so much for writing in, doing the Ghostwood mail thing. Uh, definitely appreciate that. So if anybody else 
hey, you want to write to us? Because we're talking, going to be talking more X-Files. So write to us at ghostwoodpodcast at gmail.com. That's ghostwoodpodcast at the gmail.com. It's dot com. It's, dot com. On... <laughs> it's, da- it's dot com. At ghostwoodcast on the Twitter machine. You can find us there. Or Ghostwood Twin Peaks Podcast on the Facebooks. And Zan, where can they find you? I'm on the Facebooks as Zan Sprouse, and I am on the Twitters and the Instas as Udenax19. And you can hear me talking with DJ Nick and Rachel Friend about Oscar caliber films on the Gold Standard Oscars podcast. Exactly, which everybody should check out. Highly recommended by yours truly. Because uh, I've listened to some episodes, and they're fantastic. Thank you. And, and Zane is always, always a delight. Thank you very much. I try so, to. I, so if you enjoy her here, you definitely love her there. I try to rein myself in a little bit, you know, because there's three people on that one, so there's a little less room for my yes. interjections. But uh, <laughs> I, try to bring it, I try to bring it with the trivia and the goofiness. Yeah, you do. Yeah. And you do a great, you do a great job. Thank you so, very much. Uh, and... Uh, I wish I, I wish I could give you something better to play off of now. So um, I don't know. So as for me, you're doing pretty well. We're, we're keep we're keeping our record of uh, off the cuff off the cuff Simpsons and Batman '89 references going. So I uh, we got to like, keep that streak going. Yeah, you got to you got to you got to keep it going. Exactly. We do our. I try my best. So as for me, of course, at Charles Skaggs on Twitter, at Charles Skaggs on Instagram. Uh, Facebook, Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio, and my blog of geeky things. Well done, you. Damn good coffee. And hot. Damn good coffee and hot. We're talking about all the stuff we talk about here on Ghostwood. Twin Peaks, David Lynch, X-Files, and all kinds of comic book sci-fi goodness. Um, news my other podcasts they do for Southgate Media Group, including Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast, the way I do with Jesse and assorted special guest companions, including a certain Zan Sprouse from time to time. Heck yeah. And um, uh, where we talk uh, Doctor Who, Torchwood, Sarah Jane Adventures, and then Titan Talk, the Titans podcast that I've been doing with uh, DJ Nick, where we just wrapped up Doom Patrol Season 2. Did I tell you I finally started watching Doom Patrol? No. I finally... What do you think? I, you know, I loved yeah. Brendan Fraser back in the 90s, and I still love him now. Yeah, he's fantastic. He's really, show. really freaking good. <laughs> he's hilarious, isn't he? Yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, yeah um, it's a great show. And I'm if, sorry, if you, there's you, a, I don't know if you've you've heard. Well, you need to listen to our Titan Talk episode. I know, I need to. Um, the, I believe it's the commentary for, Yeah. Um, oh, oh my God, what is the name of the movie? It's the who's in the movie? Oh, it, it uh, uh, Timothy Dalton, and it's the Simon Pegg movie with Timothy Dalton. Oh, hot fuzz! Hot, hot fuzz. fuzz! God dang it! I can't believe I couldn't think of that. Um, it's all right, they're talking. Glad to know I'm not the only one who has those kind of moments. It, it COVID brain. Holly COVID will brain. back me up on this. It is COVID brain. Um, there's a they're they're talking about. I, I think it's Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg are talking about how. I think they were screening the movie for their family and both of them, their moms and their sisters, when Timothy Dalton came on screen, they all just went, (sighs) (laughs) and I'm totally doing that every time he's on Doom Patrol. He's so damned handsome. That is a good looking man right there. (laughs) Yeah. Now there are some episodes in season one he's not in, but he's in all of season two. Yeah. So, so, and he's fantastic and he's, and he can be, he's, you know, if you if you've he's pretty much kind of how he is in Hot Fuzz a little bit as Simon. Yeah. In Hot Fuzz. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of, you know, douchiness, but but likable douchiness. Right. So right. and uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of like the chief in the in Doom Patrol. So I'm glad you're watching that because it's a fantastic show. That's why I was kind of hyping it as almost like, you know, like the superhero version of Twin Peaks almost. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's if you like Umbrella Academy, it's definitely right up that alley, too. You know, I haven't watched I haven't watched any of that yet, but uh, oh, you should need to watch that too. Yeah, highly recommend. It. I got I got a lot of things going on, but at least you at least you're doing Doom Patrol, so that's cool. yeah. All right, glad you're digging it. All right, um, hey, uh, Phantom Zone podcast. I forgot about to mention. Don't that. forget Phantom about the Zone. Phantom Zone. Yeah, so uh, Jesse and I we just wrapped up. Uh, we're talking Star Girl. 
Okay. That was on the CW and DC Universe. And trying to figure out what we're going to talk next. We might start talking Umbrella Academy. Okay. I'm hoping. I'm hoping because, uh, you know, I was talking this over with Nick and, you know, we both are huge fans of the show. And Jesse just started watching that because his wife got into it. And so hopefully it, it takes. So we'll have to wait and see. There so you fingers go. crossed for that. That always helps when, when uh, during a plague and everybody's home and everybody's watching the same show. That makes yeah. it easier. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have the kind of common bonding experiences a little bit. Yep. So it's, uh, you know, Zan's checking out Doom Patrol. Jesse's checking out Umbrella Academy. And uh, I approve of both, personally. So uh, other than that, um, next time on Ghostwood... Episode 83, getting up there. I know, right? So we're going to jump ahead six episodes from Beyond the Sea. So a little later, you know, toward the end of season one, we're going to talk shapes. And this is important because, you know, in this series where we're talking Twin Peaks actors that have appeared in the X-Files, well, this time we're going to talk Michael Horse, a.k.a. Deputy Hawk. Yep. Deputy Tommy Hawk Hill. Tommy Hawk Hill. Yep. Yep. Get it, Tommy Hawk. Get it. It's it's uh, a little racist, but it's nowhere near as racist as Cleveland's baseball team. Change the name, Cleveland. Hashtag change the name. Well, it's Indians, you know. It's you know they they still call refer to themselves, you know, in, in government sites as you know. Have the, you seen uh, Chief Wahoo? Have you seen him? They retired him. It, that's a that's a start. That's a yeah. Start. They retired him like a couple of years ago. Yeah. So yeah, he's yeah. he's gone. But yeah, there's always that consideration. Yeah, that needs to be taken into account. But I'm also uh, anyway, looking at you, my, Chicago Blackhawks. I would. Well, I'm still waiting. You know, the Redskins, the Washington Redskins, change themselves. That's the worst the, one. The Washington Football Team. <laughs> I kid you not. God. That's their current name until they come up with a better one. Yeah. Yeah, they're that's the worst. Their legal, that's their legal name. Yeah, they're the worst. The Cleveland is, the, is next, the, and then I think the Blackhawks, and then the Braves are a little bit. Yeah. If they could just stop with the tomahawk chop. Yeah, well, that's, that's, yeah, that's brave. Yeah. Yeah, it's not good. It's not good, guys. Don't the do Florida it. Seminoles. It's all just bad. Yeah. If you're going to displace somebody, don't name your shit after them, okay? It's disrespectful. All right. Um, so, yeah, we're talking Michael Horace. Awesome. I'm very excited. Yeah, which is going to be cool because, uh, you know, he's obviously a very cool actor. Love Michael Horace. <laughs> I've been a fan of his since, you know, the when he played Tonto in Legend of the Lone Ranger back in the day, back in the 80s. See, I didn't see him until Twin Peaks, and I just immediately was in love with him, so he's just amazing. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Yeah, he's so, super uh, cool. Especially, he writes such good poetry for his girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I see what you did there. Yeah. Very nice. I wrote that yeah. for my girlfriend. She's got a PhD at Brandeis. I know. I did <laughs> Mazel Tov. <laughs> <laughs> That was good. Yeah. Um, all right. So, Zan, uh, any final thoughts before we sign off? Uh, no, just uh, stay safe. If that's from uh, the COVID, the hurricane, yeah, the, you know, the cops or, yes. or, you know, white supremacists when you are trying to talk about how everybody is deserves the right to live. Uh, just stay safe, people. The idiots going after your post office. That, that yeah, kind of thing. idiots going after your post office. Uh, idiots' wives going after better people's wives' gardens. Chopping their trees down. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, it's just stay safe, people. Just stay safe, and and you know because we're because we're from Ohio. I believe that sex work should be legal. Be good to yourself and each other. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good advice. That's All right. G- so that's Jerry Springer's tagline. That's Jerry Springer's tagline. I thought it sounded familiar. We're not going to throw any chairs, though. No. Uh-uh. That's Geraldo. Geraldo throws the yeah. chairs. I got your hood. I got your hood. <laughs> it's one of my favorite quotes from uh, Austin Powers, uh, The Spy Who Shagged Me. Oh, my goodness. So, anyway. Um, so, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Uh, come on back for more X-Files as we continue our six-episode retrospective. And we're now up to episode three of that. So, uh, and then come on back. Episode 83, Shapes. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll see you next time right here, Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast. Goodbye, everybody.
made this. 